All right, so this is one of the big things that we have to get here is the contraindications list. You have to make sure that you understand this well. Most malpractice lawsuits come out of failure to recognize contraindications in practice. And the simplest way for us to look at this for grade five joint mobilizations is just to go down and look at this table right here. There's a form that you have that we'll use for examination purposes that also has a very similar list. We classify these things across as absolute contraindications, a relative contraindications, and then just for fun, the five Ds and the three Ns for cervical contraindications as well. I don't know if I've mentioned those before. Have you heard this before of the five Ds and the three Ns? No, it doesn't sound familiar. I've only mentioned it like 20 times, right? Okay, so just so we're clear, so legally I can say that I told you all of this, we're gonna go through one by one the contraindications. And you need to be able to recite these contraindications on an exam if you were asked to do so. In fact, what I'll usually do for the exam is I'll ask one person for a list of absolute contraindications, one from each category, and I'll ask one person for a list of relative contraindications, one from each category. And let's go ahead, Alex. Categories are miscellaneous, arthro, osteo, neuro, and vascular. So from the miscellaneous category, absolute would be lack of consent. You did not follow your PAR cue. The patient has not consented. And the next thing they know, they're getting their neck ripped off because they don't know what's going on. That would be a good way for you to end up with a malpractice issue to deal with. All right, so lack of uh, consent. Intoxication or drug influence, and that includes both the patient or the practitioner. Now, let's be honest. It's lunchtime. You're in your busy practice. You've already seen four patients in the morning. Maybe you go out for lunch. It's an old friend. Maybe Dr. Nick's in town. You're like, you know what, Dr. Nick? I'm going to take you out for lunch. Great. Dr. Nick likes his vino a little bit of you want to keep up with him, right? Merlot number one, Merlot number two, bottle number two comes out you might actually be contraindicated to treat somebody in those circumstances. I wouldn't because I'm visiting, but you would be in trouble. Okay, Angel, I'm talking to you. All right, watch it. Watch, watch, the, watch the devil's juice too much. Recent surgery or malingering. If you have a patient who's faking for personal gain, it could be a reason to not adjust or treat that person. Relative under the miscellaneous would be recent spinal trauma. So any kind of injury that they've had, you're definitely gonna have to modify with these relative contraindications. Prior bad experience. A lot of people make their entire judgment of a process based on one experience. It's your job to change their mind, but you have to be delicate and slow when you do this for them and just give them gradual exposure therapy is what I found for most people. Well, you had a bad experience before. Let's just try some gentle mobilizations. We're not going to thrust or anything and then work your way up from there. Undiagnosed lump or hypochondriacs. You got to watch out for those people as well to modify your treatment options. Next, under the arthro, we have severe instability, like spondylolisthesis could be there, Down syndrome, Marfan syndrome. Severe sprain strains, don't go thrusting on that. Dislocations or fusion or full disc prolapse might be an absolute contraindication. Relative would be a mild sprain strain. Acute RAs, like uh, RA or AS, could be flaring up. I don't know why I put ankylosing spondylitis twice there, spondylitis twice, but whatever. Atlanto-occipital osteoarthritis, potentially. Okay, then under the osteo, we've got malformations. You can be born without bones. You could be born without a dens. You don't really know this unless you have severe instability or it shows up incidentally on imaging. Bone destruction like osteomyelitis, fractures, or severe osteoporosis are absolute contraindications. Absolute contraindications. Spinal fusion. You are not going to hammer away on somebody who's had spinal fusion thinking you're going to improve their range of motion. You are going to cause failure of their hardware and you will be liable for that failure because you're pushing on them too hard. Hypermobility and mild instability could be a relative contraindication. Benign bone tumors, osteopenia could be relative. Mild spondylolisthesis or Schoemann's could also be relative contraindications under the osteo category. Under the neuro, cauda equina syndrome. Get me on this, doctors. If you don't get anything else, someone comes into your office and they have bilateral numbness and tingling and they just peed their pants, do not try and mobilize their low back as a treatment. Now, you might say, Dr. Nick, that's crazy. The second patient I saw as a student in chiropractic college was exactly that. They had seen another chiropractor in Vancouver, Washington. I was in Portland. And the guy adjusted on the first visit with obvious cauda equina syndromes. No, 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 no. Okay? All right. 
Next thing is going to be recent transient ischemic attacks and stroke. And actually, I'm going to even go back on that cardiac aquinas syndrome. I have a case of a naturopathic doctor where I was involved as a professional legal consult on the case. And if you guys remind me, I'll bring it up later in the semester. I'll talk about the specifics that the doctor missed and their malpractice insurance had to give a huge payout for the patient because of the doctor missing numbness and tingling, worse with Valsalve maneuver, uh, prior history lifting and twisting. It was just all perfect disc herniation. They didn't tell the patient they were going to mobilize their lumbar spine. They actually wanted to mobile. The patient thought they were mobilizing their SI joint because it's all they asked for. They did this big twisting maneuver. Later that evening, the patient could not actually had to crawl out of their bed half an hour later, got to their phone, dialed 911 and had full blown cauda equina syndrome induced most likely by the medical intervention that was offered earlier in the day. All right. So please be aware of that. Okay. If we go into the neuro relative though, radiculopathy can be relative, but again, I would be very light with my treatments on somebody with a radiculopathy. Just see what they can tolerate. If you want, again, you can type in Bisniak low back pain. I have a couple of cases up there that I put on YouTube that you can look at where I walk my way through that. First couple visits, I'm not even mobilizing the person. Chances are it's too acute. They can't even stand it. If a person has lack of peripheral sensation, whether it's a metabolic condition like diabetes or herniation from direct nerve compression, that would be relative contraindication right there. You'd have to modify your treatments. And then vascular would be stroke or cerebrovascular accident, aneurysms, VBI signs and symptoms, which are, and you need to know these in your sleep. In fact, tonight you should wake up or before Monday, because there's going to be a quiz on Monday, you should wake up and be like, dizziness, dysphagia, diplopia, dysarthria, delock, ataxia, nausea, numbness, nystagmus, done. All right. And then the other vascular ones are going to be calcific abdominal aneurysm. You really want to want to push too hard into the abdomen with those anticoagulant therapy and atherosclerosis may have you modify treatment potentially. So this is a fairly long list, fairly intensive, but are there any questions on that? I have a question. Yep. Um, so the one where you said for congenital malformation, um, would the patient know that and would they be able to tell you that? This is a really tough one. So number one, most patients are not up on medical terminology. They may have heard about it, but they not be, might not be aware. Congenital malformation usually only shows up as a secondary finding because they have imaging for some other pathology. So if you know about it, then you are liable. If you don't know, know about it, then you're not liable. So that's kind of where it sits. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thanks. I have a question too. Yep. Um, so a lot of people I know in the general public are concerned about getting their cervical, like they're getting their neck adjusted because of the risk for stroke. Um, could you just talk on the likelihood of that or how to address that when people talk to you and they're like, I would never let anyone touch my back and my neck. Yeah, yeah, totally. So that's, that's a big one to go over right there. I will actually do a separate mini lecture on that for you guys on the likelihood of stroke following the nip. Ultimately the research is across the board, anywhere from about one in 200,000 to one in over 10 million cervical adjustments may cause a serious cerebral vascular accident. The numbers that I would suggest you go with are the insurance company numbers because insurance companies base your premiums. They're all about managing risk. So if the risk of stroke was really that high with manipulation or mobilizations, you would see our insurance rates would be substantially higher for most manual medicine providers. The most people who are going to be in the most adjustments and joint mobilizations are going to be chiros. Then it's probably going to be physios or massage therapists. Then maybe naturopathic doctors, the insurance rates are relatively low. And the reason for that, the risk of stroke is extremely low. But if somebody comes in and they have difficulty speaking, signs of stroke, like do not go and thrust and move around on their neck. If they're lightheaded, don't go and move around on their neck. The last stat that I read on it was something like you are three times more likely to be struck by lightning than to have a serious cerebral vascular accident with, with a manipulation or mobilization. Having said that, it is possible, and there are cases of strokes. I'll go through all that more specifically once we get into it, but that's what I would say right there. You're likely, this, the one that works good for patients, your chance of having a serious accident, especially with the way that I teach you guys to adjust, which is very specific and very safe, is extremely low. If you look at some of these things, go on, <laughs> go on to YouTube and type in ring dinger and look at some of these guys who are like torquing necks around with big rotation, big extension that's when you're looking at negative side effects that are potentially result in very, very significant outcomes for people. It does happen to say that it doesn't happen. It does absolutely happen, but the chance is super, super low.
Okay, other questions? No? All right. So mobilizations, potential positive effects. You should do a screenshot of this. You should understand, why am I going to do this? Okay, you're going to do this, number one, for pain reduction, most likely. Someone's got pain in their neck, you're going to help them get rid of that pain in their neck. You're going to be looking at potentially faster healing times, and there is research that supports this. Short time to recover from acute low back pain. You're going to stretch contracted tissue. You're going to improve mobility, reduce soft tissue adhesion and tightness, and even contracture of the soft tissue. Increase passive range of motion. Yeah, you might restore to optimal positioning, potentially. You might increase blood flow. As we know, that's a major component of healing. You might relieve nerve compression if it's irritated. You might go ahead and reduce stress and anxiety. I would suggest to you all, breathing technique helps the patient relax, but it also helps your adjustments go a little bit better. Use breathing technique. And I don't know that many other modalities will say this, but it's very common. Placebo effect is the biggest part of a lot of the treatment that we're actually doing. Placebo is huge for people. They hear the crack, they hear something move, even though you're not addicted to crack, a lot of patients are, and what happens is they hear and they're like, oh, something really moved right there, so something was done for me. So this placebo effect has huge value. If they believe they're gonna get better, they get better. Uh, just this morning, I was writing a little bit more on some neuromodulation and pain processing networks that you can see. There's more detail on that in other places. Reduce medication intake for pain. That's a great outcome right there. One of the key ones that I would actually use. Improve immune function, potentially. This is controversial. You're not gonna go say, I'm clearing the COVID with my cervical adjustments. Although there are people out there who try and claim that, get back, stay away, all right? But you can potentially have some immune changes with it. And muscle relaxation is a big one. Again, the breathing, again, again placebo. So those are your potential positive side effects. If we scroll down, we should be aware of the potential negative side effects. This is part of you giving informed consent for a patient. This is part of you understanding the potential negative outcomes you can see. And if you warn a patient ahead of time, they recognize it as part of the therapy. If you don't warn them, they think that you hurt them. All right. Take a screenshot of this. And there's a little conversation around stroke right here as well. The research is from about 12 years ago, but it's still legit. Okay, potential negative side effects. Number one, by far and away, the most common one is going to be mild and local soreness with about 24 to 48 hours maximum time on that. It goes away relatively quickly. What did you do? The way that I explain it to patients is, I usually say there's about a 20 or 30% chance for me because I adjust relatively soft and specific. If you've got the hammer hands where you're coming in hard, it might be a little bit more of a sprain strain, but I say it's like you've gone to the gym and you haven't exercised in a while. You know how you're sore for a little bit? Well, I'll be moving you in different directions, different ways that you're not used to, and your body might just be a little bit sore following that. It'll go away in two or three days at the most. And people are great. That sounds fine. A little bit longer, mild sprain strain. You could actually hurt somebody a little bit more with this. This usually happens if you go beyond those three attempted thrusts, especially once you develop better mobilization force generation, all right? Most of you are pretty light right now. All of you, except for Jenny and Desiree, you guys are heavy and strong right now. So you have to watch your low back movements. But for most of you, you're pretty light with your forces. You're not ultimately over top of the spine too hard. So you can go a few more times than that. But really in practice, when you get good and your strength and speed is up, then you're gonna go no more than two times. Sometimes people may get headaches following cervical adjusting especially. Worst case scenario, you might actually break a rib in this case, the most prime example would either be a prone or supine thoracic joint mobilization, and you're probably doing it on Grand Grand. I will still use the same biomechanics, but if I'm on Grand Grand who's 75 years old, I am going to be very light and controlled with how I move, or there's going to be next to no thrust with that action. I'm also going to hold my hands in the nice butterfly form right here, one of these, okay? Just so you're going to be nice and soft, just like a butterfly touching down, okay? Butterfly kisses with your hands. Okay, all right. Next thing is going to be stroke. Your likelihood of having a stroke is no greater than going into a family doctor's office, and this is from the Spine Peer Review Journal from February 2008. I say that one in 200,000 because that's what some neurologists will quote at the ultra high end. Most estimates are between one in every one million or 100 million. So the chances are super low, okay? And I give you a reference for that so you can look it up. There's other references too you can see. Back to evaluating risk. At the end of the day, I'll say it again. Whenever you're trying to evaluate risk on anything, look at what your insurance premiums are. 
the more risky the procedure is, the more insurance you're going to pay. And insurance companies, their business is risk, so they have detailed tables of risk evaluation for people. All right. Uh, there's a ton of evidence on the effects of mobilization. I'm not going to go through this. There's all kinds of different pain processing networks in your brain and effect that are affected by manual therapies. There can be bottom-up influences. There can be top-down influences. Not a big deal. I'm not going to go into the pain science on this for you guys. Evidence for effectiveness. If you really care, here's 26 articles. You can go ahead and look up and see the effectiveness and how it's rated. Strong evidence for spinal manipulation in chronic low back pain cases. Okay. Your chance of low back pain in your life is about 85 to 90%. Please just know how to move a low back around. You will help a lot of people if you can do it. The million dollar roll is golden, all right, golden. All right, manual medicine tips. We'll go over those in class. There's a lot of key things right here. A couple of key points. If you're being an active student who's engaged like the angel is right now, writing things down left, right, and center, you might write down some of the high points right here. Number one, Keep your shoulders relaxed. So many of you, when you're doing it, you're all jacked up. You've decided, I would like my deltoids to be earrings for the day, and they're all up here like this. And the first thing I do is put my hands on your shoulders and say, bring them down. Bring them down. All right? Stand with your feet roughly shoulder width apart. You know I've made enough fun of this, and I'll continue to do it. If you choose the Warrior Two ultra-wide stance, you can go ahead and do that. I'm going to start grabbing your back leg and pulling you back even further. So we'll see how you wobble down into that. Okay. Roughly shoulder width apart is what you're looking for. If the patient has heavy limbs, move them closer to you, get them to the edge of the table. So they feel supported whenever possible, use your body weight. And this again, gets to sternum over contact. This gets you up over top of the person. Uh, communication is key for sure. Practice makes perfect. Awareness, if the patient is guarding, you'll see a lot of you when I set up on you, I'll say, nope, let's just take a breath and we'll move a second time, third time to get you to fully relax. I do not use the word relax. All of you right now are still doing this. You're setting up for the neck and you're like shaking the person's head. Relax, relax, okay? It doesn't work, all right? Big breath in, big breath out, nice heavy head. These are the kind of words that we want to use. Don't shake somebody hard and say relax. All right. Firm, solid contacts. If you are nervous, the patient will feel it. This was something we tried to break down even way back in our anatomy with our practical exam stuff. Smooth movements. This is what you're trying to develop right now. And the only way you can develop it is with practice. What I see happen for students, this is my graph of capability right here. Make sure I'm on the screen. You get better, 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 better. Semester ends, bloop. Better, 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 better. Semester ends, bloop, because you don't freaking practice outside of school, okay? And what is the worst? You'll take summer break, and it'll be like you did nothing. You'll have forgotten all of your skill. I will encourage you all to at least twice a week take 10 minutes and set up on somebody and just move them around. If I see you in the hallway in a more, neg more normal uh, scenario, I will literally drag you out and I'll say, hey, can you just set up on me really quick? And you will thank me for it because it will make you more kinesthetically aware. I have students come back all the time who have graduated, who were top tier joint mobilization students. And I'm like, I'd love to have you come back as a TA and you can tell right away if they've practiced it all or not, okay? If you just put a little bit of time in, it'll make a big difference for you. All right, uh, yes, there's relaxation and mood. Let me just zoom into this. Oh yeah, is it big enough yet? 400%, we're going a full 600%. Have I said this before? Mobilizations are 90% setup, 10% thrust. If, you're mo if your setup is great, the world is going to be fantastic. Breathing technique is key. Yep, all of that is good. 90% setup, 10% thrust. I talk about some anti-guarding techniques to get patients to relax that you can use. Make your head heavy in my hands. Try and let go of the tension in your muscles. You'll even notice the change in your voice, right? You won't stand way back here. You won't talk with a really high-pitched voice really fast or anything like this. What are you going to do? You're going to be nice and slow. You're going to give them that nice deep voice and say, all right, let's go ahead and have a big breath in. You're going to breathe in too. They're going to breathe out. And you're going to follow them out. All right. Analog scales. You may have noticed some of those are in the adjusting room there. Wonderful room number seven. I prefer to do weigh-ins every class to see how everybody's doing with their COVID weight. But really what these are for is, okay, Bailey, oh, you got angry there. You can see the jaw. 
the jaw came out. He knows, he knows, okay, all right? I haven't been running. What is it? If you're looking at this, this is the best way for you to see how your forces are actually generated. Using an analog scale, you're gonna push on it. When we do our, our mobilization drills, which we are gonna do every class, load, load, drop, load, load, drop. If you can grab one of the scales, things are gonna go better for you because you can see how your form is actually directing force. All right. Yeah, I'll give you guys a link to a video. If you type in Visniak adjusting drills on YouTube, there's a video there where I go through 10 minutes of adjusting drills that you can go ahead and do, okay? All right, I have a technique that I like to use just because I like making fun of uh, different acronyms that people use. I use synergistic myofascial assisted release technique to help people adjust a little bit better. It is smart therapy, smart. And if you didn't get that joke, that's what the acronym S-M-A-R-T stands for. And I'll show you guys how to do that. It's one of the key things that I like to actually use. But Okay. Soft, gentle end ranges. Right now, for most of you, when you are first learning, what you're actually doing is you're so focused on trying to set up your body right that you're not paying attention to the patient. So you hold them for a long time in a firm end feel. You can go to that firm end feel, but your hand has to be relaxed when you get there. And a big part of that is us doing hands over hands or you setting up on me or the TAs to give you direct feedback and try and set up on as many different body types as possible. We talked about this last class. I would encourage you to have little groups of four or six that we're gonna start circulating in. So that can be your still meeting the health minister's requirements for safety, your little group of six that you can circulate through right there, all right? Positive affirmations are key, okay? Every morning you get up and you probably say this to yourself, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. So you can say that for your self-talk, all right? I did a, <laughs> there's, yeah. I did a funny uh, Instagram post of some Dr. Daniel. It's all right, it's just a minor, minor surgery and it's the doctor putting the anesthetic mask over top of the patient. The patient goes, but my name isn't Daniel. And the doctor goes, I know, my name's Daniel. He's self-talking himself up right there, okay? <laughs> All right. For you, for the patient, you should do the same thing. You'd say, oh, that went really well. That moved a little bit better than I thought. These are small, positive, little, little victories for the patient that imply that things are going well for them that will give you better outcomes. This is part of my, I don't like the term bedside manner, but it really is bedside manner that you're using right here. You can use it beside the bed as well, but not appropriate. Yeah, you know, that's that was a weak joke. I apologize. Okay, I will do better. No, Angel, take a shake on that one off. All right, okay. <laughs> Oh, I gotta work on my material. Seinfeld, come on, buddy. Okay. What's the deal with the bed? <laughs> okay, next thing you have to be aware of is PARQ. Informed consent is key. Every soap note that I have has PARQ given written on it because I am always checking in with patients. Let me know if you have any pain or discomfort. Is the force okay? Let me know if we have to modify this. I'll check in two or three times on a 20 minute visit just to make sure. This is smart doctoring right here to make sure that you're not going to deal with negative outcomes, or at least the patient wasn't surprised by them. Okay, practice drills. Force equals mass times acceleration. You can either get heavy or get fast, and you can even learn how to spell develop correctly. Is that how you spell develop with an E on the end of it? The heck? No, it's got to end with, end with the P, right? That's one of those ones I always get wrong. But I can spell spondylolisthesis, no problem. Pheochromocytoma, no problem. But develop, nope. It's my autistic nature coming out there. All right, so the bottom line is this. You can actually set up and do side posture adjustments on people. As long as you don't have their spine torqued, you can just hit right into their iliac crest and start to develop that good force and have a real body to work on. Next thing you can do is you can go ahead and use scales to develop that force as well. Here I am doing a prone adjustment. Hips are moving down, hands are moving down together. Here I am doing a side posture adjustment. Hand is moving in as the hips would be moving down. Pillow thrusts, we did some of these, didn't we? Pillow thrusts, after Brittany decided to not give out the yoga blocks. What? <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, this is what you need, I'm an expert. Here's some yoga blocks. Why don't you just give people bricks, okay? So it's pillows is what you're going to use and you fold the pillow up and you can do a supine thoracic like this. You can go ahead and do a prone thoracic, see the leg motion and everything to get your biomechanics down. And it is load, load, drop. You are tissue pulling first and then giving your thrust. 
So it's slow motion, think of following the patient's breath out, and then you give the thrust at the end of it. You can even take your own thigh. You're bored in class, you're all bored right now. I'm gonna do this, angle this thing down. Get my party at the party down below here. Oh, you can't see it. I gotta back up. What can you do? Everybody's sitting down. Grab your thigh, it's like a thick neck. Some of you have really larger thighs, so you're gonna be like ultra thick necks. I have like, I have my pencil neck, so I've got my pencil thighs I can grab. They're basically the same, okay? You're gonna set up and you can go load, load, thrust. Load, load, thrust on your own thigh. What I would do is I would thrust from the, if you grab your right thigh, I would thrust with my left hand is how I would do it. So I would push on the inside of my thigh is how I would thrust. That'll most represent what you're actually gonna be doing with patients, okay? All right, so that'll get you through that. And we'll show this one next class. You can kind of do the same thing if somebody sets up and you do this motion with their wrist right here. So you can go ahead and thrust into their wrists, thrust into their wrists. This actually really closely resembles a neck when you get the setup just right. Okay, so pretty good there. And, all right. And then I also like, I break these down, YouTube, Visniac drills, okay? I'm not gonna be talking about drill bits as much as I'd like to. We'll be talking about drills for adjusting skills that you can look up. Drills for your skills. Okay. Questions on any of that? I feel like I got to stop for a little bit. No, I'm still rolling. Okay, no questions. Common technique errors. The number one error is lack of practice. That's it. You don't put the time in, you won't get it. If you do practice, people think practice makes perfect. Nope, practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. That means you need to get direct feedback on how to get appropriate biomechanics. If you are practicing repetitively to do it wrong, guess what? You get really good at doing it wrong. So that means you wanna get these foundational movements down first with the experts in your, in your bubble, literally our COVID bubbles here today, all right, that you wanna work through. Okay, so common errors. This hasn't happened in a while. Everybody's been good with this for the last little bit. And at least if it does, people get up so fast because they don't want me to see it happen in the classroom. Number one is the dropsy-daisy, okay? Dropsy-daisy, that's not gonna be me. And yes, I came up with all these names myself, the dropsy-daisy. So what happens? If you look at my knee, it is straight up and down. That means if somebody pushes into me, I'm gonna fall over with them. My foot is probably under the table when that happens. So as long as your tibia is leaning towards the table, the chance of you dropping somebody is basically zero. You can control big people. And sometimes when you set up on me, if you set it up good, you've heard me do it. I was like, I'm going, don't let me fall in the lava. So you can stop me, all right? But if I see your knee is off a little bit and there's some mats behind you, guess what's gonna happen? I'm gonna roll and we're gonna be on the mats together. And then you better be ready to fight for your life. <laughs> Angel, I love it. Okay. All right. Okay, so dropsy daisy, number one. Jujitsu it up. It's like a transition. Okay, do you guys know Patrick Barstock? Maybe you know him or not. He was a big CrossFitter. He graduated about three years ago. Him and his sister Aaron were the two CrossFitters. No, maybe not. Okay. Anyways, all the time, that guy was incredibly strong. And every single time, I would set up on him right next to the mats. And I'd be like, okay. Let him set up on me. Let's go ahead and see what you got today. And it took him like three times to the mats before he got it, but eventually he got it, okay? It's good physical learning. Next one is the straddler. So what happens with the straddler? Most of you recognize this leg way out back here. Most of you don't. Look at the amazing dorsiflexion this guy's got on right here. Look at how old those pants are. I like those pants because they're cashmere, but they had the, like the old, uh, what do you call them, cuff at the bottom here and stuff, but yeah. Anyways, nowhere left to drop. And if you are the straddler, the straddler leads to incidental contact. Uh-oh. Okay, so watch out for that one. Yes, and this is where I have my yellow card. Right there it says, carry a whistle and use a yellow card. It's fun. Okay, like you guys think I just, this is in the literature now, all right? Okay, it's fun as the instructor. The death grip, some of you are still right here. You're trying to do such a good job and it's like, oh, squeezing them down. No, you are delicate, you are relaxed. Most of you, if you see me come up and I grab your shoulders and I just twist your body like this, 
where I just move your upper body and twist you over a little bit, I'm trying to get you away from this shoulder position. People think they're strong when they push back with this shoulder like this, but you're actually not. You're stronger if you stay in front of your body inside of that strike zone. When I was in school, there were two chiropractors that came through selling everything in their practice because they could not practice anymore because of anterior rotator cuff injuries in this position. Okay, that is a very weak position for your shoulder. If it was just body weight, you're doing some kind of yoga push up or something like that, sure, but otherwise you need to stay away from that position. Okay, some of you are still right here as well, the bilateral thrusters. So, what are you doing? You can, can everybody see? I'm gonna blow this way up. Can everybody see the skin? That's how I can tell you're doing it wrong. Brittany, this is like touch, this is the equivalent of touching your face for the adjusting world right here. Look at the wrinkles, like she is lean. She actually has a six pack when we're actually doing these videos right here. And look at those wrinkles, ugh, okay? There's no support for that. You can see both hands are pushing towards each other. That is very uncomfortable for the patient, okay? Very uncomfortable. All right, and then other areas that we have is the macho muscler. This will usually be men right here. Sky butt, what happens here? You get your butt higher than your head and you get beached, literally. It's like you're a whale and you're stuck on top of the patient. You can't actually thrust, your feet come off the ground. And if you're with me, I'll gently continue that roll and put you gently on the floor, okay, if there's mats. And then hammer hands. So our goal with the thrust is actually load, load, thrust. What are most of you gonna do? You're gonna go load, load, lift off, hammer in and think something's gonna happen, okay? Smooth is better. So let's just look at the video, look at my hands. Load, load, thrust, not load, load, thrust like that, okay? You think you're more powerful, you actually lose strength and it's more uncomfortable for the patient. Oh my gosh, and what does this say at the bottom of the page? Mobilizations are. 90% setup, 10% thrust. Why do I feel the need to do that? Because most people don't read books and I have to say it again and again and again. Okay, now if you wanna get technical, here's some grades of forces that are actually used in different thrusts, not a big deal. You're generating anywhere from 22 pounds minimum up to 215. I got a measurement when I went out to the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College up around 350 is what I could generate. And that's like more than double my body weight. Is it? Yeah, it's more than double my body weight. So roughly it's more, it's about double your body weight. And if you're faster, you can get higher than that. I think I actually got higher than that, but all right. Different thrust types. Don't really care that you guys know this because right now you're just like, how do I even set up for a thrust? But there are different thrust types you can do. There's a thrust called bring the thunder. The first one didn't go, so it's like light bang, and then you really hit them, okay? It was so fast, I don't even think the video caught that up. All right, eh, yeah. And then, oh my gosh, Dr. Nick, you mean there is actually references? You've got 92 references for this first chapter? Yes, I do.